Aren't you glad now that we have a great high priest who sits at the right hand of God making intercession forever for us? And we have the promise also of his presence. And that's been the theme. That was the theme last week. God's promise of presence to be with Joshua and uphold him in whatever God called him to do and whatever God calls us to do. Uh, That theme continues. We're going to continue to talk about God's presence in Psalm 139. Psalm 139. Where are we here? We're going to read the first 10 verses, actually. Now, that's already been read in our scripture reading, so I'm not going to read the entire thing, uh, but I uh, just need to find my place here. This is actually a passage that... Uh, when I was in furlough, in the, uh, I, was, I was in the U.S. for a year, and I was asked to speak on a couple of verses, uh, Psalm 139, verses 9 and 10. They gave me 10 minutes uh, to preach on those two verses. How can, you, how can you preach such truth in 10 minutes? I don't know. Uh, it just left me with a hunger. I said, what a tremendous passage. What a tremendous reminder uh, to us of God's presence. I need to expand this. You know, I need to, I, I need to make a, a, a full-fledged sermon out of this. So, Oh, probably about a month or so ago, I uh, started working on it, and this is uh, the message I came up with from, from Psalm 139. So I need prayer. You need prayer. So let's pray and ask the Lord to bless his word this morning. Lord, thank you again for this word. Lord, it's, it's your word. It's not ours. It's not, the, it's not the words of men. It's not the whims of people. This is the very word of God given to us. Lord, we thank you that we have it. We have it in our laps to read. We have it on our devices. We have it to to hear uh, taught and to hear preached. Lord, I pray that you would help us this morning as we're reminded of your presence, as we're reminded of of uh, the fact that we can never escape from you, that you are always with us. Now, Lord, that is certainly comforting to us. But Lord, it's also challenging to us. It's also a, a very serious thing for us. So, Lord, take your word and hide it in our hearts that we might not sin against you. Lord, take it and help us to be encouraged and to be challenged and to take it with us even this week. And Lord, not only to... Uh, to uh, take it into our hearts, but to live it out this week as we live our lives for you as believers in Jesus Christ. Help us to live as those whom you are present with all the time. Bless our time in your word, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So we're going to go through this passage, taking special attention, really, to verses 9 and 10. And these verses, this particular passage, reminds us that it is impossible to ever escape, to ever be removed from the presence of God. Now, that is comfort, and that is joy to the person who knows God through Jesus Christ. But it can also be a very sobering thought to us that that God is present with us always, that there can never, ever be a time when God will not be with you to uphold you and to keep you. You know, we commonly say to each other, uh, God is with you, or maybe God is with us. But are we really aware of the, the majesty and the weight and the glory of those words? God is with us. I think due to the dullness of our flesh and oftentimes the weakness of our faith, it seems that that truth, that God is ever present with us, doesn't always shine into our hearts and lives and into our daily walk as it should. Now, God, think about this. God, infinitely glorious, uh, matchless in holiness, infinite in power, uh, the, the, the creator of all the heavens and the earth, the living and true God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the one whom the Bible says the angels cannot even look upon because of his holiness and his majesty. Almighty God is with me. 
He's with me. I can never be removed from his presence. Now, these words we can trust. These words we believe. But does the sheer weight and the glory of those words really shine in our lives as it ought to? Guarding our hearts from every evil way. Comforting our hearts in every distress. And showing us that if God is with us, that will show us what we must do every moment of our lives. Every moment of every day. This truth that God is ever with us is at the very core of our Christian existence, of our Christian faith. According to the Gospels, Jesus was sent by God the Father to die on a cross for our sins and rise again that third day, all to secure this blessing that God might be with us as the God of our salvation. All that Jesus Christ did when he was here on this earth, all that he did was so that he might, at the end of his ministry, as he was uh, departing from his Uh, from earth, uh, departing from his disciples as he went into heaven, he could say this. He could say, Lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Jesus Christ has secured for us sinners. He secured for us this one incomparable, unequaled, unrivaled blessing that God is with us in his grace and in his power, in his love and in his wisdom that we can never be removed from God. And this one thought that God is with me is really the most necessary thought that I need for my Christian life, for my faith. We must be gripped by by faith in this one reality that God is ever with us. God is ever with me. Now, think on this as I point out. And uh, uh, does everyone have an outline? If you don't have one, we can get one to you. Just raise your hand. I'm going to give you the outline right away. At least the major points here. Roman numeral 1, 2, and 3, okay? Okay. Think on this as I point out from the text. First of all, Roman numeral number one, the inescapable presence of God. The inescapable presence of God. Secondly, we're going to see the wonderful intimacy in which he is present with us. The intimacy in which he is present with us. And finally, Roman numeral number three, the practical effects of his presence. How should an awareness of God's presence in my life flesh itself out? Now, David is meditating, especially on verses 9 and 10, on the inescapable presence of God, Roman numeral number one. Now, not that he wanted to, but that he could never escape. He could never remove himself to any place where the Lord would not be. And he could, never, he could never transport himself with such speed that he could ever leave the sight of God. That God's presence could not be escaped. And in this beautiful psalm, Psalm 139, David is led by the Holy Spirit to contemplate three awesome attributes of God. I'm going to give you those three, A, B, C. First of all, he wants to point out God's omniscience. God's omniscience is the fact that he knows all things. He knows everything. Letter B, he wants to point out God's omnipresence. The fact that God is ever-present always. He's everywhere. There's nowhere we can go to escape his presence. That's his omnipresence. And finally, God's omnipotence. The fact that he is almighty. He's all-powerful. I'm going to go through, actually, the first two. 
uh, God's omnipresence and God's omniscience and God's omnipresence. Uh, God, the fact that God is omnipotent, the fact that he's all powerful, I think is referred throughout in, in, in the entire chapter here, Psalm 139. So it, that's inferred. So I'm going to start with God's omniscience. That the fact that God knows all things. And you know what? God knows all things all the time. Okay? That, that is, his knowledge is ever conscious in him. God does not have stored memories. In fact, uh, an example this morning, I'm, I'm walking in the doors and I'm trying to remember everyone's names. You know, okay, okay, who is that? You know, trying to bring it. I know it's in the back of my mind here somewhere. It's on the tip of my tongue, but I'm trying to bring it up. God does not have that problem. Right? He does not call his thoughts to the forefront of his mind. They're always there. Right? All that God knows, and God knows all. All that God knows, he knows all the time. He says in these opening verses, we'll start with verse 1. O Lord, thou hast searched me and known me. Thou knowest my downsitting and my uprising. Thou understandest my thought afar off. Or you could say here, you understand when I'm daydreaming. You understand when my thoughts are rambling. Or before these thoughts ever even come to my mind, Lord, you know them. Before they're even formed completely in my brain, Lord, you know my thoughts. You know them. Look at verse 4. For there is not a word in my tongue, but lo, O Lord, thou knowest altogether. So David says it's not simply a matter that God knows everything. In other words, uh, God knows the number of grains of sand on the seashore, or God knows the number of planets, stars up in the sky. He can count them all. That he knows uh, uh, the, the, uh, he has knowledge of the snowflakes or of the birds or of the, the, the seeds that need to go into the mouths of the bird. Yes, God knows all that, but it's, that, it, it's not simply that case that God knows all things, but David says it, it's not simply that, but, it, but the fact that God knows me. God knows me. He knows my thoughts. He knows what I'm thinking before my words ever get to, the, to, to my tongue or lips. What we might say, call our self-conscious thoughts. Those thoughts that nobody knows. Maybe you know, sometimes we don't even know. Uh, God knows them. God knows those thoughts. He knows it right now. He knows it at this very instant. He knows everything, every, absolutely everything about me. And about you, right now. And then David goes on in the following verses to ask the question, how does God know us? Does he know us from a distance? I have in mind a song. Maybe you've heard this one before. Uh, God is watching us from a distance, right? No, not the case, right? Does God's knowledge uh, as some men would think, uh, God is that, uh, that, that, that great being up in the sky who watches us from a distance, and maybe someday we may have to meet him. Is that God? Is God's knowledge of us compared to some uh, government agency that, that, that sends a satellite over the church? And that satellite is, is beaming down and taking pictures of what we're doing here and sending it to this government agency so that they can have some idea of what's going on here at Calvary Baptist Church. Is God's knowledge like that? Is God's knowledge like a, like a drone that's flying over a terrorist camp just to find out, you know, sending back those pictures of uh, the, uh, the number of combatants and the weapons they have or whatever? Is God's knowledge like that? David says, no. No, David says, that's not the way he knows it. From a distance, God knows it as the one who is present right here. God is here. His presence is all over his creation. There is no particle of the creation where God is not. And yet with all of his being, God is here with me. 
Now notice how David, by inspiration, develops this in the psalm. He wants to look at God's omnipresence. The fact that God is here with me, with all of his being. Now imagine that. I bet you can't, really. And that's why I think that David says, such knowledge is too wonderful for me. We can't comprehend it. We cannot attain to it. God, with, God, with all of his being, the living and true God, with all his being is here with us, beside me, upholding me at this very moment. And he says in verse 7, Whither shall I go from thy spirit? Or whither shall I flee from thy presence? Can I get away? Verse 8, he looks at it in terms of the up and down. And he says this, If I ascend into heaven, thou art there. If I make my bed in hell, thou art there. There is no place up or down where we can escape the presence of God, where God is not. You know, if I, if I go up, and somehow escape the pull of gravity, and go out there and float among the stars, the Bible says God would be there. If someone were to take me and nail me in a box and go out into the outback somewhere where nobody knows and bury that box in the sand, God would be there. Nobody else would know where I was. God would know. God would be there. No one can take me from God. And then in verse 9, he becomes poetic, really. He starts to think horizontally now, right? First he was thinking vertically. Now he's thinking horizontally. He says this, If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, So he's referring here in poetic language when he talks about the wings of the morning. He's talking about, uh, you know, when you see the sunrise and those first shafts of the morning light as the sun comes over the horizon, shoot across the land at the the speed of light, really, right? Those first shafts of of the morning light, and he imagines here that he's able somehow to saddle up one of those rays. He's able to climb up on top of one of those sunbeams, one of those rays, and shoot off at the speed of light. And he goes over the planet, and he finds himself on some unknown island way across the sea, maybe in the middle of the sea somewhere, some distant, uncharted island where no man has ever set his foot. And what does he say? Does he say... God will catch up with me? No, he would say, God is there. God is there. And as I was transported by the light, it was God who held me in his hand, who upholded me. God is omnipresence. He's everywhere. All that God is, in all he is, he's here. Where I am, where I sit, where you sit, where I stand. Every moment of my life, all that God is, glorious in his holiness, matchless in his power, wonderful in his praises, he is here where I am. I am in uh, inescapably, you are inescapably in the presence of God. Now listen to him declare in Jeremiah Chapter 23, verse 24, to the prophet. This is God speaking to Jeremiah. He says this, Am I a God at hand, saith the Lord, and not a God afar off? Can any hide himself in secret places that I shall not see him, saith the Lord? Do I not fill heaven and earth, saith the Lord? This is the thought that is overwhelming and amazing David here and should certainly overwhelm and amaze us. This is a source of great, great comfort. Not only for us personally, but certainly it must be a source of comfort sometimes for parents of small children, even adult children, right? For wives, for husbands, 
for those whose loved one, a child maybe, is running from the Lord. They're, they're running from him, trying to outdistance him, but they can't. They can't, and the shepherd will bring home his sheep. And this thought is not only comforting, though, it's also challenging. Because the reality of God's presence is a truth from God's word. And as we read God's word, we realize that it's not only there to comfort us, but it's also there to sanctify us. It's a, God's presence is a source of sanctification for us. Because you see, we can't just uh, think of God simply as theologians, right? Knowing a lot of facts about God, but never letting it sink down and affect us in our daily lives. We can't do that. Never letting it change the, the, the way we live. In fact, a knowledge of God's presence ought to change the, the way we approach every issue of life. What is the real issue of our hearts and lives? Is it God? Certainly, should be. No, God, who is not make-believe, but God who is. God is with me. And we can see him here in our circumstances. Our circumstances, when we're anxious and we're worried and we're thinking, you know what, I don't think we have enough funds to, to pay our bills for the rest of the month. What are we going to do? Does God know? Does God care? Lord, thou knowest my downsitting and my uprising. God knows. Will you trust him? When you're tempted to let your eyes stray to those lustful images on the internet, you begin to think impure thoughts God's word says, thou understandest my thought afar off. Does that make you think twice? When I'm prone to get angry and spout heated words to, to those who I think have it coming to them, for there is not a word in my tongue, but O oh Lord, lo, O oh Lord, thou knowest it all together. God hears it. Would that make you hold your tongue? God is with me. All in all that he is, he's with me now. No wonder David at the end of this psalm says this. He says, search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts and see if there be any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. David got it. And David is bringing this out, not only for our comfort, but also for our sanctification. But he's also bringing it out, uh, in, in, uh, this is Roman numeral number two, I think. He's bringing out the wonderful intimacy that he has with God. The intimacy that he has with God. Because as David continues in verse 10, I think it becomes even more amazing. How is God's present with me? Right? Is he present with me the, the way that he's present with every human being? So, so that nobody can hide himself from God? Is that the way he's with me? Is he, is he present with me the way he's present with the wicked right now? Right? He's weighing them. He's judging them. He's leading them to destruction. So that Daniel can say to Belshazzar, remember, the, the king of Babylon, the God in whose hand thy breath is and whose are all thy ways hast thou not glorified. King, God has your life in his very hands and you have not glorified him. You have not given him the credit he so deserves. Is that the way that God is with us? To judge and to weigh and to condemn well, no. David is looking at it, I think, in terms of God's grace. He says in verse 10, Even there shall thy hand lead me, and thy right hand shall hold me. He's speaking here of that which is intimate. Right? That which is close. <coughs> that which is preserving and protecting. 
And when you consider those words, your hand, thy hand will lead me. Thy right hand will uphold me. They come really with three beautiful truths. Three beautiful truths about how God is present with us intimately. First of all, I think this is letter A, right? First of all, God's hand, if God's hand upholds me, uh, God's hand in the Bible refers to his power. His power. His unbridled power. So then, if God's hand upholds me, that means that God is present with me in my life in, by his power. With all his mighty power. Psalm 95, verses 4 and 5 say this. In his hand are the deep places of the earth. The strength of the hills is, also, is his also. The sea is his, and he made it. And his hands formed the dry land. He holds the whole world in his hands. And he, in all his mighty power, is with me in his grace in Jesus Christ. Psalm 138 in verse 7, just before this psalm, he says, Though I walk in the midst of trouble, thou wilt revive me. Thou shalt stretch forth thine hand against the wrath of mine enemies, and thy right hand shall save me. So for God's hand to lead you is to be led by the power of God. But secondly, letter B, he speaks of God's right hand. And God's right hand in the Bible is a picture of his skill and his wisdom. His wisdom. You know, commonly our, our, our right hand is, is that hand that is uh, the hand of cunning. And now I know most of the time that's true. Some of us are left-handed, right? Some of us may be ambidextrous or whatever, but prob- probably not the majority. The majority of us are going to be right-handed. So that right hand is a reference to that which we do, with which we do cunning work. So also the right hand of God refers to his wisdom, the wisdom of God to lead us, the wisdom of God to hold us. Psalm 73, verses 23 and 24. Nevertheless, I am continually with thee. Thou hast holden me by thy right hand. Thou shalt guide me with thy counsel, and afterward receive me to glory. The counsel of God, his inscrutable wisdom, and his, and, and his being held by, uh, by his right hand are united in the thought so that it is a reference to God's wisdom. We have God's power and God's wisdom. But finally, God's right hand represents, yes, his power and his wisdom, but also his grace. Because think about this. uh, We are at the right hand of God. God upholds us with his right hand. Who is at the right hand of God? Christ, right? Jesus Christ. If God's hand holds me, with, if God holds me in his right hand, Who is sitting at the right hand of God now? Christ. David knew this when he wrote Psalm 110, verse 1. He said, The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou at my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool. So this passage teaches us that God is present with us in his power. God is present with us in all his wisdom through Jesus Christ. In all his grace. It's a promise that God will never remove his love and his grace from us. That around me will always be the power and the wisdom and the grace of God from which nothing can separate me. Nothing. What then are the practical lessons we can learn from God's presence. When I realize that God, in all that he is, is with me now, in his power, in his wisdom, in his grace, what are the practical lessons we can learn from that? Well, I have four. I'll give them to you. Number one, or letter A, it might be, when we believe this truly, that God is with us, it will be a conviction to resist 
secret, strong temptations. A conviction to resist secret, strong temptations. Have you ever, as a child of God, experienced this? Maybe you were, you were tempted in some area to sin, and you simply said, I cannot do this because God is with me. And I'm not asking for a raise of hands, but has that ever happened to you? For me, probably not, not often enough. Not because someone else is with you, not because someone else is here, not because the eye of a parent or a pastor or whatever it is, it doesn't matter, not because their eyes are here, but because God, my God, is here. Especially in a sin not so public, right? but a sin so private that when we commit it, we make sure, so to speak, to close the drapes, shut the, shut the windows, close the curtains so that nobody knows what we're doing. But does anybody know? God knows. No one but God. That truth that God is ever present with me in his power and his wisdom and his grace in Jesus Christ, that's a sanctifying power. If it is real and if it is true by God-given faith, then it will convict us. It will convict me in the moment of that secret temptation for evil. Joseph. Joseph was a young man working in Potiphar's house. You remember the story, right? He was sold into slavery. He's working at Potiphar's house, and Potiphar's wife tried to seduce him. She just worked on him day by day, and one day she found him alone, uh, and Joseph responded to her advances by saying something like, how can I do this great evil against God? You know, Joseph himself was more aware of the presence of God than he was aware of the presence of a seductive woman. <coughs> and he resisted it because he knew that his God was there with him. How much time? How much time do we spend in our lives covering up our sin? And thinking we're clever. God sees them. How foolish. How foolish we are. Our sins are obvious to God. When our kids were two, three, maybe four years old, in our house, we liked to play a game called hide and seek. You probably played it with your children or played it as a child before. And at that age, at the age of two, three, four years old, they really just don't get it, do they? You know, they can hide. They'll go, and what they really think is if they can't see you, you can't see them. And so they'll, they'll hide in the closet or they'll hide behind the drapes, something like that, with their feet sticking out. Obvious they're there, right? And you're sneaking through the house saying, where are you? You know where they are, right? And they're, as you get closer, they're giggling and they're laughing. They give themselves away. They just don't get it at that age. Their their foot is visible, but they believe they're concealed. They don't get it. But friends, do you and I get it? As mature Christians before God, do we get it? Do we live our lives of faith before the eyes of people? What they will see or before the eyes of God, that he is present with me. So the the thought of going contrary to his will is unthinkable to me. The thought of grieving my God becomes unthinkable. And that is what the Bible means when it says the fear of the Lord is what? It's to hate evil. How often 
does the presence of someone else prevent us from sinning? You know, you're speeding down the road and, oh, wait a minute, there's a policeman. What do you do? You hit the brakes and you slow down. You know, you're having a spat, a spat with your spouse all the way to church as you're driving to church. And you park in the car park out here. And as you get out, you put a smile on your face like nothing ever happened, right? Because you don't want anybody to know. We will delete our internet history so that we can try to be sure that nobody knows, even our own family knows, the websites that we've been to. What did Jesus say? What did Jesus say about the religion of the Pharisees? How did he sum it up? He summed it up this way, that they may be seen of men. The practical effects of God's presence, one of those practical effects, will be a conviction. You will feel convicted to resist strong, spirit, uh, strong secret temptation. Let's look at the second one. The second practical effect will be courage. Courage to face difficulties and trials. Now, if there's one thing that can be said about your lives from the Word of God, I can tell you for sure, I can say this on the basis of the Word of God that should God give in His mercy, give you uh, years of life. One thing I can say for sure that will happen in your life, probably many times, and that will be difficulties and trials. Difficulties and trials. In fact, there's no way into the kingdom of God, but through difficulties and trials. If you are going to follow the Lord Jesus Christ, he said, deny yourself, take up your cross and follow me. The trials you face will be many. The trials you face will be unique because the Lord knows our soft spots. And you know what the devil does too, doesn't he? Those are the areas that the Lord is trying to shore up in our lives, to make us stronger in. So he will lead you through some fiery trials. And you will have difficulties. You will have obstacles before you. You cannot avoid it if you follow the Lord Jesus Christ. But when you know that the Lord is with you, that your God is, is gracious, and he is with you, you can have the courage to face whatever difficulties that the Lord sees fit to bring into your path. We can face them with courage. Now, we know God doesn't do it by simply taking the problem away. Sometimes he, uh, he, he through his grace, goes with us and promises to go with us through those trials as we go through them. And we learn, right? We grow and we learn. We learn of God's presence in difficulties. We learn of God's compassion and his help in difficulties. And we learn to lean on him. And that's a good thing. God has us right where he wants us. I know it's hard. It's hard for me to say, Lord, thank you for the trials. Sometimes, sometimes I feel like Job, you know, when he says, I, I look to the left for you. That's the left for you, right? I look to the left. He's, I don't see him. I look to the right. He's not there. I look behind me. I can't find God. But even in our life, when we come to the conclusion, if we ever come to the conclusion that it's so difficult and hard that God is somewhere gone or that he's forsaken us, then we are wrong. We're wrong. Can God ever be absent from us? No, he can't. He will be with me. And that's our courage to face whatever difficulties that God see, seems to put in our path. Isaiah 43, verse 2. When thou passest through the waters, I will be with thee. And through the rivers, they shall not overflow thee. 
When thou walkest through the fire, thou shalt not be burned, neither shall the flame kindle upon thee. For I am the Lord thy God, the Holy One of Israel, thy Savior. I will be with you, he says. And that's courage. That's courage to face any difficulty. Practical effects. Number one, conviction to resist those secret sins. Number two, courage to face difficulties and trials. Number three, confidence in our calling. Confidence in our calling. The Lord has a calling for you. We're not church consumers, right? We're not here to get what we can get. We're here to give. The Lord has a ministry for all of us. He's calling you into his kingdom. And you may be seeking that calling, what the Lord might want you to do in your life. And you're wondering what that calling may be. The Lord has given you certain desires, certain abilities, and you think you understand, or maybe you have some inclination of what the Lord's willing you, uh, what the Lord wants you to do. But wherever the Lord leads you in that calling, you will... In fact, as he leads you in that calling, you are going to experience your own inabilities and your own failures. It's inevitable. You're going to experience them. And you may come to the point where you say, you know what, I can't. I cannot do this. I just can't do it. I quit. Lord, there's been some kind of miscalculation when you asked me to do this. You, 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 you miscalculated. I cannot do this. But now this, this is your confidence. Because he says this, even there your hand shall lead me. Notice how the verse begins, right? What's the first word? Even there. Even there shall thy hand lead me, and thy right hand shall hold me. God called Moses. We talked about this last week, right? God called Moses and said, uh, and Moses certainly uh, protested and said, Lord, I'm a, I'm a man of slow speech. I can't do this. I have a slow tongue. And God responded, Moses, go. Right? I, I made man's lips. He said, certainly I will be with you. I will be with thee. To Joshua, talked about this last week. To Joshua, he said, as I was with Moses, so I will be with thee. And you could go down the list, a whole list of people, all those whom the Lord has called to serve, and almost every one of them said what? They said, Lord, I can't do it. Gideon. God comes to Gideon and he says this. He says, the Lord is with thee, thou mighty man of valor. Now, wait a minute. What was Gideon doing? What was Gideon like when God called him this mighty man of valor? Gideon was a bowl of jelly. Gideon was terrified. He was hiding in the wine press, hoping that the Midianites wouldn't see him. That's when the angel comes to him and says, the Lord is with thee, thou mighty man of valor. He, he wasn't out there with a sword, right, going after the Midianites. He was cowering when the Lord called him. I think that tells us that when God sees us, his servants, uh, he sees us not from the perspective of who we are currently, but of what he can do through us. Because he's with us. Listen to God's word to a young woman, an unknown virgin in Nazareth. He's going to tell her that she's going to give birth to the Messiah. What does the angel say? Luke 1, verse 28. Hail thou that art highly favored. What are the next words? The Lord is with thee. See, angels... Even angels believed that the highest qualification for service to God was God's presence, was the Lord is with you. No other qualification even compares when God is with you. That is confidence in our calling. 
And finally, you might say, finally, okay. God's presence means comfort for our hearts. Comfort for our hearts. Perfect comfort. The Lord is ever with me. Isaiah 26, verse 3. Thou will keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on thee, because he trusteth in thee. Stay your heart on the Lord Jesus Christ. Stay your heart on God. Remember those three Hebrew young people in the book of Daniel, again. You know, they were far away from their people, from their family, from their friends in Babylon. And they had come under the rage of the king. For their confession of faith that day, the king has decided to throw them into a burning, fiery furnace. But while they're in there, the fire doesn't consume them. And they're still walking around, and the king draws as close as he can to that fire, to the, to the flames, because he discerns now that there are not three, but there are four men in that walking around in the flames. And he says, the fourth is like the Son of God. He is with us. He is with us though we stand, though we walk in the midst of the burning, fiery furnace. His name is Emmanuel. God with us. God is with us. And his presence gives us conviction against secret temptation. It gives us courage to face difficulties and trials. It gives us confidence in our calling, and it provides us comfort for our hearts, even in the most dire of circumstances. So my challenge to you, I hope you take this to heart. You go out and live it out in your lives this week. Let's go out this week and live our lives as if God is present with us every moment. Can we do that? Let's practice the presence of God this week. Let's pray. Lord, thank you again for your word. God, thank you for the promise of your presence. God, we can have no other comfort. We can have no other challenge than this awesome, unrivaled blessing that we have, that you are ever with us. Lord, remind us of that day by day, moment by moment, as we live our lives this week, as we live our lives, yes, in front of people, but Lord, also as we live our lives behind closed doors, to know that you are with us, guiding us, protecting us, Lord, keeping us from sin. Lord, bless our week. Thank you for the chance to hear your word this morning, for the challenge it is. May not one of us leave this morning without being challenged in some way. Bless us now as as we conclude in Jesus' name. Amen. All right.